For more than a century, Central Baptist Church in downtown Noonan, Georgia, has been keeping house for God. During that over 110 years, Central Baptist has served not only its members, but its community as well. Worship has always been a primary focus of the life of Central Baptist Church. Since God gave us His best and His only begotten Son, we feel compelled to give God our best. From the way we dress to the music we sing, we realize we are in a holy place when we're in God's house. Now, let's worship the Lord as we join this past Sunday's worship service already in progress. Welcome to worship on this beautiful Sunday morning. It's good to see all of you present today. We know this is a holiday weekend and a lot of traveling and coming and going. So we're glad that you're here uh, on this occasion. If you are our guest today, we want you to know that you have honored us with your presence. And if you would like to receive more information about our church, uh, you'll find the visitors a registration card in a pew rack near you. If you complete that card and return it to us later in the service, perhaps in the offering plate, uh, we'll make sure that we provide you uh, your requested information. Hope you'll not rush away at the end of the service and let folks speak to you before you leave. This afternoon at three o'clock, we'll be hosting a memorial service for Cornelia Farmer uh, daughter of Hugh III and Carol Farmer. Uh, she died unexpectedly this past Wednesday. She lived in Houston, Texas. The service at three o'clock this afternoon, followed by reception at the Farmer home in Grantville. Next Sunday, we'll have a celebration service for Carolyn Sale, who will be marking 47 years of music ministry at this church. What a remarkable thing you've done, Carolyn. God has blessed you with gifts and endurance, and uh, we look forward to celebrating your 47 years of ministry uh, next Sunday. And after the second service, there will be a reception held in Carolyn's honor. And uh, if you have not had the opportunity of doing so, I remind you that a love offering will be presented next Sunday and the deadline for receiving uh, that offering would be Tuesday of this week. I know you'll wish to be a part of that. The Lavinia Barron Book Club meets tomorrow night at 715 in the home of Martha Lee Child. This is a change of location from what uh, had earlier been announced. Uh, seniors will have their breakfast at Chick-fil-A Dwarf House on Wednesday morning of this week at 9 o'clock. That reminds you that our first congregational dialogue is scheduled in the Fellowship Hall this coming Wednesday evening. The dialogues are a centerpiece of the transition process that our deacons have led us to be involved in. I have a lot of questions from various people about the dialogues and the conversations. First, I will say that uh, the dinner will be served on Wednesday night beginning at 5 o'clock so that we may begin the dialogue by 6 o'clock. Youth and children are to go directly to the youth building when you arrive. Uh, the meal will be served for youth and children over at the youth building and adults will gather and meet uh, and eat in Fellowship Hall. Uh, these dialogues are the centerpiece of the actual process that we are engaged in uh, for preparation for the future. We prepare for a new pastor down the way and also uh, an opportunity to talk to each other. These dialogues will be centered around small group conversations using questions that are designed to engage uh, each other uh, in sharing what is important to us as a congregation. It will have a clear sense going forward of our identity and probably for the most part reaffirming who we know we already are. But we get clarity for that and we take ownership of it as a congregation as we move forward. So uh, this is a unique church in the truest sense of the word. There's not 
another moderate Baptist church like this in the region. And we have characteristics that uh, we want to highlight, make sure that uh, we identify those and value those as we move forward. Each congregational dialogue will focus on a different subject. So uh, some have thought if they did not come this Wednesday night, they could come at a later dialogue and make up for it. Each dialogue will be on a different subject or different topic. So please try to attend all the dialogues. This first will be this Wednesday night and then we'll be planning other dialogues on other times and dates. Hope you'll not miss any of these, that you'll be involved in dreaming and sharing together in small groups so that everyone has an opportunity to share his and her thoughts. We'll look forward to seeing you on Wednesday evening. Again, welcome to worship. May God bless us all as we worship the creator and sustainer of the universe and the Lord Jesus Christ, our personal Lord and Savior. Please join me in the call to worship. 
God talked with Adam in the garden and told Noah to build an ark. God spoke to Moses in a burning bush and promised Abraham a son. John heard God's voice at Jesus' baptism, and Paul heard God's voice on the way to Damascus. God's wisdom is known through the word. God's love is known through Jesus Christ. God's prompting is known through the Holy Spirit. God speaks through the beauty of creation, the counsel of other believers and through our praise, music, and prayer. In our worship and in all the circumstances of our lives, as we listen in faith, speak to us, O God, that we may hear and respond. Let us pray. Lord, we gather in your presence to praise your holy name. Through our songs of praise and our words of thanks, we seek to honor you, God. Help us to be still and listen, for it is through your guidance that we are able to find peace and understanding. We ask, Lord, that you continue to teach us to follow your lead when we are not sure what path to take. Fill us with your spirit so that we might have comfort in your presence with us today and always. In your name we pray, amen.
morning, please join me in the reading of the litany. King of all the earth, creator of the universe, holy triune God, from everlasting to everlasting, you are Lord. We will give thanks to you, O Lord, with our whole hearts, for your glory is above the heavens. From the rising of the sun to the setting, we praise the name of the Lord. You raise the poor from the dust and lift the needy from the ash heap, transforming them with glory and honor. <coughs> you bring fruitfulness from barrenness and give families to the solitary. From the rising of the sun to its setting, we will praise the name of the Lord. Who is like our God, the one who looks down from the heights on the heavens and on the earth? This is our God, the Almighty One. Give thanks to the Lord. Bless the name of the Lord. have the boys and girls join me in the front. Good morning. How are you? How many of you have, you want to come sit over here so I can see you? Come sit over here. How many of you have ever seen or heard about something called a compass? Like this, this is what a compass looks like. And actually, there are probably a lot of people that have a compass that's not on their phone. I don't have one, though. This directs you in the point of what direction you're in, north, south, east, west. Um, and so probably most people have one on their phone now. People like um, pilots and people who fly in space shuttles and people who work at the space station they use compasses, and if your parents um, need to go somewhere, do you think they would use a compass? <laughs> you said no. Once upon a time, they might have. Now they have this thing called a GPS. Have you ever had your parents use one of those? Turn right in 300 feet. Have you ever heard that? Yeah. Yeah, millions of times. So that's probably on their phone, too. These phones are handy-dandy these days. So we use things like that to direct us and where to go, right? Did you know that God gives us directions too? And, and he gives us tools to use to guide us? Do you, can you think of, to help us, can you think of things that God might give us to direct us? Food, maybe, yeah. What about the Bible? Is the Bible one of the tools? Love, oh yes. One of the other things we use is prayer. Is that when we talk to God? Mm -hmm. And experiences with people or your own experience or people that show you love. That's a, that's a guidance God gives us. I'm going to tell you one way God guided me. You want to hear a story? When I went to college, I went to college in North Carolina. That's far away if you get in the car. It takes like eight hours to get there. Oh, awesome. Awesome. <laughs> So you, I got in the car and I drove to school and I didn't know anybody there. And I went there because I wanted to be a, a ballerina. <laughs> and I didn't end up being that. But I think God ended up sending me there because you know who I met there? My husband. I think God told him not to come today either because he would be embarrassed that I told this story. But, I, <laughs> but I, when I got there, I met him. How would I have even met him in North Carolina if I had not gone to college there? So I think God guided me there so that I could meet him and we could get married. That's a good, good story, isn't it? 
You went to a wedding yesterday? Okay. So you need to look and use God's tools to direct you. Listen for God to give you things in, in your heart or your mind to do. Pray to God. Use the Bible to learn about God. Those are all tools God gives us. Let's pray. Lord, help us to use the tools you have given us to follow you and make sure that our life is headed to, in the right direction. Amen. One of the tools that God has given us each week is the opportunity to join together and pray for those in our community and faith community who are in need. So let us join together now in prayer. Compassionate God, when we feel exiled and far from you, when we forget to sing your praises, and when life isn't going our way, we are grateful that you do not forget us. You continue to guide and be with us throughout our journey. As we rest in this promise of your presence and love, remind us now that you are with us and those in this community of faith who are dealing with recovery, grief, and heartache. We pray for the family of Monica Lovett, for LaRoyce Wright, who is recovering from surgery. Continue to wrap your arms around the family of Cornelia Farmer as they struggle with their loss. We pray for the continued rehabilitation facing Francis Mann, Gloria Murphy, and Dan Phillips. May your spirit also surround all the victims and those who have been affected by Hurricane Matthew. And we take just a moment of silence to remember those who are on our hearts. As we remember these and others on our minds, we commit to doing what we can to reach out to these friends and family members, as well as praying for them in these difficult times. Let our prayers and service to these mentioned be guided by the way you taught us to pray when you said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
please pray with me. Gracious God, we come before you with humble hearts and joyful souls. We rejoice in the gift of your presence here with us today in this place of worship. Lord, we know that many of us are blessed beyond belief while others are far less fortunate. We forget that we have been given much and that we too must give in return. God, we present these gifts and these offerings today so that they may serve you and glorify your holy and precious name. Amen.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 13. I'll be reading verses 17 through 22. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around the desert road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. After leaving Sukkoth, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Faith lives with the certainty that God is involved with all living creatures and that the Creator guides all created beings. God must be involved, otherwise it would be really difficult to explain some of the things that some of them are able to do. For example, the Arctic Turn a sea bird of the Tern family, Sternidae, lives seven degrees south of the North Pole. Yet the Arctic Tern migrates 11,000 miles to Antarctica for the winter and then returns 11,000 miles back to where it started, seven degrees south of the North Pole for the summer. No one has ever been able to give a satisfactory explanation as to why the turn can do this. Some believe they may be able to navigate by seeing polarized light. Others believe that they navigate from the position of the sun and the stars. For the believer in the creating God, there remains yet another explanation. God gives the gift of guidance to this fleet flying bird. The Atlantic salmon leaves the place of its spawning, swims downstream as a silver streak in the sunlit stream, makes its way 900 miles out into the ocean, and then by some unknown process, finds its way back to the exact tributary that it left. No certain reason exists for its navigational guidance. Some scientists believe the Atlantic salmon is sensitive to slight chemical differences at the mouths of different streams and is able to detect the stream from where it came and swims back to its original spawning place. But an added explanation for at least some of us of faith is that God gives the gift of guidance to the fish. At the flight de deck of commercial jetliners, the captain punches into the computer the digital coordinates of latitude and longitude for his or her destination. These numerical signposts prompt the computer to lock in on ground level transmitters or satellites above 
to give automatically the guidance needed for a certain location of arrival. And every day, millions of pounds of metal hurled through the skies above us, filled with people who are dependent upon the undetectable slight electronic signals that fill the air. Would it be too far afield to suggest that it is God who gives the gift of creativity and genius, enabling us to create sophisticated ways to plot our travel around this globe and beyond, and to be able to identify those slight electronic signals that float invisibly around this earth? By what process does God guide people of faith? If God is concerned about the fish and about unseen electronic signals, how does God guide humans? How does God guide people specifically? How does God guide groups of people like the chosen people of Israel or like the Christian church? People like us. The Old Testament text for today instructs us along these lines through the Exodus experience of Israel. Through the study of that passage, we may learn that God leads people of faith through the course, through the route, through the way that God opens before us. Sometimes we refer to that way as opening and closing doors. God called Moses, for example, to leave the tending of his father-in-law's sheep on the backside of the desert, which he had done for 40 long years. And God called him to leave that know-nothing of a place and go into Egypt and stand before Pharaoh and open the way for God's people <coughs> to leave their slavery and their oppression. Other than the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Exodus stands as the mightiest expression of God's power in all the Bible. The scripture tells us that 600,000 Hebrew men, plus their families and their animals, walked out of Egypt, away from slavery and oppression, out to their destinies. But they not only walked away from their oppression, God had prompted Moses to tell the Israelites to ask the Egyptians to pay them to do so. And scripture says that the Egyptians gave them jewelry and clothing and sent them on their way. Not only did the Egyptians regret doing what they did, as you know later in the story, they tried to stop them to no avail. This magnificent story reveals how God guides. We can even see how God guides through the roots that God chose. God did not guide the people, according to our text, along the short way away from slavery. You would think that would be the preferred route to get to the promised land as short a distance as possible and cover that distance as quickly as possible. But God did not lead the people to go the short, direct, obvious route. God guided them by the long, indirect, unexpected one. Exodus 13, 17 tells us, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, even though that was the shorter route, it was nearer to the promised land. For God thought to himself, if the people face war, they may change their minds and go back to Egypt. Now I remind you that there were two ways to go from Egypt to the promised land. 
One was the short way, the Via Maris, the way of the sea. By that route, the Israelites probably wouldn't have taken more than a few weeks or even a few months. It would seem that they could march almost straight from Egypt to the promised land. And that would have been the obvious route, as I've suggested. After all, they'd been captive for 400 years. And you would think they would want to get to the land flowing with milk and honey as soon as possible. But their leader, Moses, felt God was leading them a different way. And so God sent the children of Israel home to the promised land by the long route. So they tracked along the waters of the Suez arm of the Red Sea through the wilderness. Now Moses had spent 40 years in the wilderness and he knew there was nothing to eat, nothing to drink, nothing but wilderness all about. But Moses felt that God purposefully led him and then would lead the children of Israel by the longer, more time-consuming route. So God led the children of Israel a roundabout, indirect way. God's direction for their future, as someone has written, began with a detour. Some of us can identify with that. Sometimes we feel God is leading us to become this or to go there or to do that. And then it seems as though we have a dead end in front of us or a detour. And we get frustrated with that sometimes. We just want to get on with it and get wherever it is that we're going. Why do you think God sometimes leads us on a detour? Why does sometimes God lead us on the long, time-consuming way? Well, it's something to think about. God led the Israelites the long way because there were enemies along the way that they were not ready to deal with, not ready to face. They were not ready to face the Philistines. Strong, fierce, fighter people they were. And their home was along the short way. Even as it was, Scripture tells us, the first time the Israelites ran into some challenges, they were very upset with Moses and complained and said, Moses, listen to us. If you had just left us alone, we could have stayed in Egypt as slaves. After all, we were accustomed to doing that. We've done it for 400 years. We've always done it that way. It sure was a lot more comfortable, they would say. Another writer has said that the Egyptians, first time they encountered a problem, wanted to go back and dance the two-step in the brick vats of Egypt. They wanted to go back to the way it used to be. And I've observed from time to time, even in the 21st century, when the people of God are led to do things a new way or to experiment with doing things a new way. It's not unusual for the people of God to want to go back to doing it the way they've always done it. I've even seen that happen in churches along the way. By the way, just a, an aside thought. The long way around for the Israelites gave God the opportunity to demonstrate divine power and the victory that only God could give. I remind you that the Gulf of Suez is 160 miles long and averages 30 miles wide and averages 54 to 84 feet deep. Yet this was the very location of the famed parting of the sea by which the Israelites were rescued from Pharaoh's army. Had they not taken the detour, had Moses not felt led to take the longer route, they would not have experienced God's powerful victory 
when they were caught, if you please, between the devil and the deep blue sea. Wedged between Pharaoh and the impassable sea. You see, God may also lead us on longer, more time-consuming routes for our own maturity. God is more interested in our character than in our arrival time. God is more interested in our being who God wants us to be than how long it takes us to become who God wants us to be. It took 40 years for the Israelites to develop the character God wanted them to have before they arrived at the land flowing with milk and honey before they arrived at what God ultimately wanted them to experience. But we need to remember during the 40 years, God stayed with them. God gave them direction. God provided sustenance for them. And they learned to lean on God for resources and for guidance. Indeed, they could only experience continued existence by leaning on God's promises. Only after the discipline of 40 years did God then lead them to their destination, to the promised land. So God leads people of faith through the course, through the route. God opens the way before us. God guides us by opening and closing doors. God also guides through the supernatural. Our text says in verse 21, Exodus chapter 13, And the Lord went in front of them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them along the way, and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light so that they might travel by day and by night. Israel never, ever forgot this supernatural intervention by God. They refer to it in the Psalms. They refer to it in the prophets. And it is also referred to even in the New Testament. Now the scripture says that there was a clearly marked pathway from Egypt to Succoth. But at Etham they entered the trackless wilderness. In other words, when they got there, they were on the edge of nowhere. There were no signs. There were no maps. There were no guides. There were no GPS available. Just empty desert nothingness. And at that very moment, at the time when they most needed guidance, at the time when they were at their wit's end, it was then that God provided divine guidance and direction. Not a minute too soon. Not a minute too late. Dr. J.I. Packer, a well-known British theologian who taught in Canada for many years, once wrote that God will not give supernatural guidance until it is absolutely needed so that everyone around and all of us will know without a doubt that it is God's supernatural guidance. And I would suggest to you that in the weeks and months before us, as we dialogue and as we have conversation with each other, about the future that God wishes for this congregation, I would remind you that God will guide us in various ways. He will give us and remind us of our experiences. The 119-year history of this church will guide us. There will be some impressions that will come to us that are natural, that come out of just good common sense and from our experiences. And I would suggest that there are other times that the, there will be guidance that comes beyond the natural, weaving in and around the natural, 
there will steal over us, perhaps very quietly, a sense of God's supernatural guidance. And we will be gripped by it. And we will know in our heart of hearts, this is God's guidance. I often refer to this kind of supernatural involvement with us as the inward nudges, the inward awareness, almost like a nudging of the elbow, an instant in which God will break through and we'll simply know that this or that is the way to go. This is what God wills for the future of our church. And you will be moved by that impulse, that inward bending of your will toward what you become convinced is what God desires. And the inner nudging and inner urging of the Spirit will not go away. That's a part of how we will know it is God's guiding us. And we'll, be, we'll feel compelled to act accordingly. And God will confirm that that is God's nudging through that inner sense of contentment or that inner sense of peace that comes as we make decisions in response to the nudging of God's Spirit. One writer put it this way, pray, peace, push. Pray about the decisions our congregation will make. That's one reason I've been urging you to pray every day at noon. Just make it a habit, but not ritualistic or routinely. Pray about the decisions our congregation faces and pray until we sense a peace about the direction and then push forward. Now I realize today in this brief message we've only scratched the surface on how God guides. In the early part of our service, in our litmus, in our music, we talked about a multitude of other ways that God guides. And I trust that the thrust of all that we've been focusing on today will help us be even more sensitive to how God guides. And that we'll be sensitive to God's guidance as we move toward the future that God wishes for this wonderful congregation. Remember, pray, peace, push. May it be so. In a few moments, we'll be led to sing our parting hymn. And as we sing at that time, if there are those of you who wish to make commitments to Christ that you would like to share with me, I'd love for you to come and do that, or perhaps to come to be a member of this church. If there are other decisions that you wish to make, you may wish to do so in your own mind in the inner recesses of your own very being. Now is the time for us to simply allow God to nudge us in the direction he wishes us to go individually and as a congregation.
now may we pause for our benediction. Today we go from this place, but never, O oh God, from your presence. When the challenges are great and the way is unclear, may we sense your divine presence and the nudge of your Holy Spirit to clarify our direction and affirm your will and your way. And now I invite you to savor this moment of silence before returning to a world that is filled with noise. <laughs> 